my name is Charles Goldfarb, and I'm joined by my co-host, Alexander Aleem, for the AOA podcast, Lessons in Orthopedic Leadership. This is our first episode of season three. It's been about 18 months since we launched this podcast. I'm pleased to share that our listenership continues to grow, and we will continue to tackle topics of interest to all leaders, but especially those in orthopedic surgery. Each episode will welcome a guest with expertise in a crucial leadership area, and today I'll turn it over to Dr. Aleem to introduce and welcome our guest for today. Alexander? Thanks, Chuck, and it's uh, amazing to, uh, can't believe that we're already on season three. This thing started out very humble, and I'm excited to see the trajectory of it. But today we are honored to be joined by Shannon Huffman Polson. She is the author of the book, The Grit Factor. Courage, Resilience, and Leadership in the Most Male-Dominated Organization in the World, and the founder of the GRIT Institute, a leadership consultancy committed to whole leader development and a focus on grit and resilience. As one of the first women to fly the Apache helicopter in the U.S. Army, leading line units on three continents, Paulson combines her passion and firsthand experience in study of leadership and grit to de- deliver world-class keynotes and training to companies and organizations on leadership and grit. After serving in the armed services for a decade, she earned her MBA at the Tuck School at Dartmouth and currently lives in Washington, uh, as I just found out, in the uh, east side of the Cascade Mountains with her husband and two boys. And importantly, uh, Shannon was this year's presidential keynote speaker at the AOA annual meeting, and her talk was titled The Grit Factor, Going for Grit in Times of Change. Shannon, it's an honor to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Alexander. Thanks, Charles. Nice to be with you both. All right. Well, let's let's jump right in. So, you know, your talk at the annual meeting was super well received. And actually, I went back and uh, listened to it again in preparation for this. And so it really it is fantastic. So thank you for that. We want to, you know, build on what you shared. And uh, some of the listeners, if they've missed it, obviously will want to go back and listen to it uh, or watch it, you know, again. And I'm sure in your preparation for that talk, you came to understand or were told that uh, while the U.S. Army may be the most male dominated organization in the world, Orthopedics is is not is not doing so great. Uh, we're working towards a better balance, but we we share that challenge. How yeah. uh, how do you think about uh, male female issues when you think about leadership? Yeah, you know, it's it in a way it's unique to every circumstance, and and in a way it's it's all the same, right? I think a lot of the opportunities really do have to do with opening the lines of communication to understand where people are. I, I'm often asked like, what, what skills do you bring that are unique as, as a woman? And I, my answer is I bring unique skills as myself, as any woman will, or as any man will. And I think some of us are better at harder skills and some of us are better at softer skills. And so when I've talked to companies who are struggling with diversity or, or really working to, uh, to make it a little bit of a more balanced workforce, one of my first questions is, what questions are you asking? How are you asking those questions? And how are you listening to those responses? And then the second part of that, of course, is how are you taking those responses and incorporating those into the work that you're doing? And oftentimes, um, that's sort of where people stop asking questions. They stop talking, and they realize that that's the work that that, that really lies ahead. That's great. And I think, you know, Chuck alluded to, we really, it's one of the, I think, Key, key missions of the AOA and, and sort of orthopedics right now is to increase the diversity, especially for women. I'm interested just in, in your coming up through the army, coming to a service field in which there's not a lot of women, where did you find mentorship and support? Because one of the things that I found interesting when talking to women medical students that are applying into orthopedics is they find that they actually get discouraged, not by orthopedic surgeons, but by others who sort of have perceptions of orthopedic surgeons say, oh, you don't want to go there. You're not like them. And interested to see if you kind of found anything like that when you were trying to, when you were coming up into a helicopter pilot. Yeah. You, you know, I had the opportunity to work with some of the best and some of the worst people that I've ever known in my life. I think uh, people, the military is big enough that it's a bell curve really. Right. And I guess most organizations really would fit into that. Uh, and because there weren't any women who had preceded me, that, that mentorship never came in the form of another woman that I could look to and say, here's a woman leader who is doing something that I want to do in a way that I'd want to do it. So I had several male leaders who were outstanding. I wouldn't say mentors as much as they did mentor me, but they were not mentors to me in a formal sense. Uh, But certainly my first battalion commander was outstanding. I had people working for me who were outstanding as well and taught me every bit as much as the people that I was working for. So I think looking up and looking down is important. 
Um, and at the same time, if I look at the, my, my military career holistically, which was a, 10 years in uniform, I chose to move on from that career into, uh, you know, through business school and into the corporate world, I think in part because I didn't have that mentorship. And as I did the work for the grit factor, and you know, from the presentation, of course, that this grit factor is not just my own story, but it's really the synthesis of dozens of leaders in the vanguards of their fields, right? And those people who stayed the longest, and the research supports this as well, who stayed the longest in their fields to continue to contribute, to continue to perform, are those who did benefit from mentorship. So I would go to the opportunity that lies for all of those industries looking to, again, to better their diversity quotient, but it's really about inclusion too, right? It's not just the diversity, it's the inclusion, which is maybe even more important by saying, how are you mentoring those people coming up? And how, as a male leader and a male senior leader, are you looking to mentor both men and women? And, uh, and I think that's a really important piece because the studies seem to be pretty clear, at least in the corporate side, that people stay longer and are better engaged when they do have the benefit of that relationship. I love the saying diversity beyond the numbers. And I think you kind of hit on that, which is, you know, we're not just looking at numbers. We want people to be super successful in uh, whatever role they choose to be in. So maybe you didn't have ideal mentors, although people, you know, helped you along the way. Would you call what you had sponsors? Um, that's a term that gets thrown around a lot in my world, although it's a little nebulous, but people who are advocating on your behalf. Yeah, I, I mean, in some cases, yes. I think, again, those people who had longer uh, longer term careers have sponsors on kind of a more long term scale as opposed to in discrete assignments. So, you know, and I won't repeat too much of what we talked about in the presidential address, but of course, the grit factor after doing these interviews and doing the background research breaks out into this grit triad, this commit, learn and launch. Right. And that learn is the deep engagement in the present. And you get to that after doing the work to own your past and then you look towards the future. So that deep engagement in the present starts with building your team. And so going back to your original question, Alexander, is like, where do you get that support? That support has to come from a lot of places. And part of that is your you know, family and friends or whatever that circle of intimates is. We all have to have that, however it is that you define that, because you've got to have that, that core support, no matter, no matter what other support you do or don't have. And then I think there's the opportunity to have that collegial support as well. There's, you know, from, from other lieutenants, if you're a lieutenant or other young, uh, maybe residents, if you're a resident, I'm sorry, I don't know the industry as well uh, in orthopedics, but, but people at the same place that where you are. And then you're looking for people maybe outside of your field who have done something possibly similar, who can then advise you more strategically. And that's how we think really about mentorship is being a little bit prescriptive, honestly, because setting those boundaries is really, really helpful to keep that relationship going, to make sure that there aren't uh, expectations that are not met, and to say, hey, these are this is a strategic point of contact. Maybe it's every month, maybe it's every two months. Uh, and then the sponsorship is another thing yet, right? Somebody that's advocating for you in those meetings and those closed doors meetings and saying, hey, this person really needs the opportunity to shine. So I think there's an opportunity to address each one of those as, uh, as you're bringing more people, a more diverse group into any field. That's fantastic. One of your themes that you talk about in the book and in the, in the talk is grit is a learned skill. And I think for a lot of us and we talk about grit as kind of being one of those intangibles when you first sort of think about it. And, and just in, in one of my other roles is I'm the residency program director and we look at applicants. And one of the things we sort of judge them on in a 10 minute interview is do they have grit or do they not have grit? And it's a huge discussion and Chuck's, you know, been in these meetings before and we, you know, and it's, it's also this whole, you know, whole the millennial discussion. They don't have as much grit as maybe the greatest generation and that kind of stuff but you really have a different sort of take on it. And I think it's really interesting because this is something that you can then learn. And, and I think that that Triangle talked about, it's great. Maybe, you know, for those naysayers about millennials, like, is it, they don't have grit or is it just that we're not necessarily teaching them this or is it just different? And we're not used to how they perceive grit versus maybe an older generation. Yeah, I, I don't buy that they don't have grit. I, um, I think we're not asking the questions and we're not listening. And I, I, because a lot of us who have been around a while, and now I get to count myself in one of those that have been around for a, longer than I'd like to admit, uh, we think we've got it all figured out because it worked for us, right? We, we did it, we made it work and we did it in a certain way. And if somebody's doing it in a different 
different way. We may or may not actually understand uh, that, that perspective, that approach. And so that's where I think, again, just in the same way that if you're looking at diversity and inclusion, right, or taking diversity beyond the numbers or however it is that you want to talk about it, uh, and let me give you a very specific example, because I think this could apply to a millennial as well as it could apply to bringing a woman into a field where there's not many women or any other minority that's not well represented. I talked to an accounting firm a number of years ago. <clears throat> they had all men, all white men, of course, uh, in their board and, and in their senior leadership. And they said, you know, we really want to bring up this, this woman to be a partner. But she just said she's not interested and I, we don't really know what to do. Like, what do we do? It's we're trying to make this better and, and it's not getting better. And I said, well, well, what does she say that she needs? And the guy and, and the guy who he's the he's the head of the firm, right? This this multinational firms just looks at me and it's and he's never asked the question. And so I think if we are expecting that people come along in the same way that maybe we came along, and any of us who have kids, by the way, <laughs> know that doesn't work, <laughs> um, then we, you have to start asking the questions. You have to ask the questions, and then you've got it. And I have a whole chapter, as you know, in the grip factor on listening, right, on being an active listener. Most of us, and I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, presumptively include orthopedic surgeons in with attack helicopter pilots. We're really rewarded on execution, right? We get stuff done. We do it well. We do it fast, we're, we're good at our jobs. But that often on the flip side of that means we may not be very good at stopping, asking a question, really listening and internalizing that response, not judging it against our own experience or on what our expectations are, but really listening to that and then being willing to move forward, maybe with a different perspective. And, uh, and you, and again, I'll give you techniques for this in the grit factor, but, but that really, I think is part of understanding or working to understand where another generation is coming at something where another, where another gender, where another person with another background is coming from is really doing that work of listening. And, and I think what you come to with millennials in specific to come back to your original question is the millennials are driven by purpose in particular, right? So it's not necessarily just about like, hey, get the job done. Like for us, for me, that's what it was, right? It's like, get it done. I don't care what you, what you think about it. Like you just get it done because that's the right thing to do. Well, that's not going to work the same way with the younger generation. And so I think it is incumbent on the leader whose honor it is to lead, right? Like it is an honor to lead other people. And, and to do that doesn't mean dictating and teaching necessarily, it might also mean listening and adapting. In fact, it does mean all of those things and it has to include all of those things. So I think that's really an opportunity for growth, probably for the younger person also, but also for the leader. And that's where it's harder because again, those of us who have been around a while think uh, we figured it out for us and that may or may not work for somebody else, but that's hard, right? That's really hard work, especially when you're managing a practice maybe and you're managing all the challenges of, you know, reimbursement and everything else that you're, you're having to deal with on top of doing surgeries on top of doing, maybe you're doing research. I don't, I don't know, but you've got a lot of responsibilities. You also have a family at home and, and now you've got to relearn leadership. Well, that's, it, it's part of it and it's hard, but I do think it's an opportunity to really allow people to come to the table and contribute their best if you're willing to do that work. As we, uh, there's so many different directions we can go. I don't want to veer too far off topic in yeah. case Alexander wants to come back here, but as in your book and in your previous keynote address, you talked about building grit, uh, getting back yes. to Alexander's question. Yes. And one of the things that I latched onto that you said, and, and there's numerous techniques, but one is do hard things, get yeah. better at hard things. Can you elaborate on that? It really does resonate because we feel like we are in you know, the trenches doing hard things all the time. How does that help? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, this is all a balance too, right? So it's not all about like, hey, leaders, get your act together because the millennial, it's really on you, not the not the young people. It, 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 it's a balance. And part of that balance is for some people who haven't done hard things a lot in their lives is saying, hey guys, time to buck up. Like it's time to, to, to make this work. And, and you're gonna get better at doing hard things by doing hard things. The, the science is pretty clear on that. And part of this is uh, many of you will know Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset from Stanford. There's some other work as well, actually, interestingly, that will apply to your field for sure, which was a continuation actually was advised by Dweck on the stress mindset, which really looked at going into a situation that was really challenging 
And they looked actually at Navy SEALs going into BUDS training. And those who went in with this mindset, like, oh my God, this is so stressful. I'm just going to have to get through this versus those who said, hey, stress is going to enhance my performance, right? And those that went in, not surprisingly, with the mindset that stress could enhance their performance, graduated at a higher rate. They performed better at discrete and measurable tasks, and they had 60% fewer negative peer evals, which is pretty amazing. So absolutely it's clear that you can build grit by doing hard things. Part of that is the mindset piece that goes into it, absolutely. And I used to not like the term mindset because it feels amorphous, but it is critical to approach the task with the right mindset. Now there are tools to do that. And we talked through some of these in the grit factor as well. One of them, and this comes directly from the Army's Master Resilience Training Program, which comes from the University of Pennsylvania's Positive Psychology Program, which is decades of research, of course, is actually the, the work of reframing. And I will say for me right now, and I think a lot of us are in this place where I just uh, realized, you know, I used to make fun of people who were like, oh, the pandemic will be done in three months or the pandemic will be done by June, right? And I was like, oh, what are you kidding? It's a global pandemic. Well, now we're at a place where I actually thought we were going to be kind of done and we're sort of starting over <laughs> and uh, or it feels like that. And so it's it's exhausting. Right. And I think people are exhausted. And uh, and I know in the medical field, you've got so much going on besides this as well on top of this. And so reframing the challenge as opposed to like, oh, my God, how are we going to keep doing this? It's reframing the challenge to say, hey, what are the opportunities here and try to put it's not being a Pollyanna, right? But it's putting a different perspective on the challenges that lie ahead. It doesn't mean at all that they aren't significant because they are, but it does put a different spin on it. And that is a, a very small, but important and tangible and manageable technique that I think comes out of, of this work of building grit. And this is shown to build grit and build resilience. It's, it's interesting because, you know, I think again, back to a couple of questions ago when you when like, superficially look at grit it's kind of the opposite you think oh you got to get yelled at and you got to get stomped on you do hard things you're gonna get beaten down and the people that kind of come up are the ones that are the grit and and it's actually interesting that we're reframing this into this positive psychology that really seems to build it up and there's been a lot of discussion about you know positive feedback potentially being better than negative feedback yes. is there a role though for potentially negative psychology in this buildup obviously you want to focus on the positive but when do you have to sort of maybe make an example of somebody with a negative feedback or sort of negative reinforcement? I mean, I think all of this is a balance, right? And I, I feel like very in a very broad sense, one of my biggest frustrations with any issue that we talk about in life, whether it's political or educational or, or psychology, is that we, we have this, this false dichotomy. It's not a dichotomy. It's absolutely a continuum. And so I, I think that continuum, that understanding of where you go on that continuum comes from experience, comes from watching and seeing what's working and what's not working, because every person is different as well, right? You don't use the same techniques to bring one person along as you do for another person. And again, I'm going to use the kid analogy. I have two kids that are eight and 10. They could not be more different. If I did the same things with, with either one of them that I did for the other, it would completely fail. And in fact, it does <laughs> regularly. So I think the same thing is true here. There, are, Yeah, there's times for negative reinforcement for sure. I, I mean, I, that, that's a, a personal opinion that I can't uh, give you the study to back up, but I think it is about a balance. Um, I don't believe you ever make an example publicly of somebody in a way that is not constructive. I mean, I know in classrooms sometimes and probably as, as surgeons, you probably have to do that. But I think you want to be careful and uh, I can refer back to the historical example of Germany after World War One, if you want to, to make it just kind of a meta sort of a comment, but like, you don't want to cut, you don't want to bring people down so much that it's destructive, right? You want to bring it down so that it's constructive. And I think at the end of the day, if the intent is positive, the intent is learning, the intent is taking care of people and building them up because that at the end of the day is our job as leaders, right? Our job is to build people up, to continue to develop them, to give them opportunities, to shape them so that they can best contribute. And when they can do that, they're gonna feel, they're gonna, they're gonna be on fire, right? So that's your job as a leader. And when you do that, you've gotta find that balance for each person. And I hope that's not too ambiguous of an answer, but, um, but it is a balance for sure. Can you build a little bit or give specifics on uh, positive psychology and and how we should incorporate that with feedback and just with our daily interactions with those who are teammates and those whom we quote unquote lead. 
Yeah, yeah. And there's so many more elements to this besides reframing is one of the many techniques that, that we talk about um, specific, again, to the Army's Master Resilience Training Program. But this is true for any of us. Again, this is just something the Army is finding what works and then using that uh, from the work that they've done at University of Pennsylvania. Another piece that is so you know, it's so, it seems so small, uh, but, and, and you've, you've seen it all over magazines, popular magazines, so that you almost dismiss it, but truly it's very, very clear that writing down, actually writing down gratitudes <laughs> every day is something that will change your mindset and change your approach and build that grit and build that resilience. And I can give you one example of a team that I know of that um, starts their team meetings now by sharing gratitudes. Everybody shares a gratitude about either somebody else on the team, something else that has happened. Um, and again, that doesn't mean you don't talk about the hard stuff, but you're starting out with this attitude. And again, it's it's the way that you are approaching things. I think when you when you approach people with with love, like I'm I'm helping you out, I'm 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 here to help you, I'm here to help you be the best orthopedic surgeon you can be. If I know that that's what your job is, that you you believe in me. I'm going to take the negative feedback too, right? But if I think you're just there to, you know, th that you don't even care, then all of a sudden that becomes something that's much more negative. So on the positive psychology piece, yeah, start at, starting out a meeting, no matter what the meeting is, no matter what level, whether you're very, very senior or very, very junior with the gratitude, honestly, is a great way to start to make a difference. And I've heard amazing things from teams that are working on that. Another piece, and, and this is a, a little bit of a tangent from the positive psychology, but I know for the last year and a half, again, those of us in professions like yours, um, like ours, have been working maybe even more than, than we were before, and people are tired. And uh, the other example that I heard that I love from another company is that they're starting meetings or including within the context of an agenda for a weekly meeting is talking about self-care like basically normalizing it, like saying, hey, I'm leaving today at four o'clock and I'm going to go for a six mile run, which is one mile farther than I went last week. Or, you know, I'm going to take Friday off and go to the soccer game and take my wife out to dinner or my husband out to dinner, whatever it is. But so normalizing and celebrating people taking care of themselves. And at the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself in order to do your job well, in order to take care of your family and to take care of your teams. And, uh, and I think coming back to the place where we're refocusing on what matters most, this comes back to gratitude, right? But you're refocusing on what's in your heart uh, because leadership is about heart. And you refocus on that when things feel like they're out of control. And that brings you back to that commit phase of the grit triad. That's great. I think, you know, the wellness perspective of this, it really rings true, I think, in, in the medical field. Even before the pandemic, physician burnout was a major topic. And then I think the last year and a half obviously really highlighted it and across healthcare workers, um, especially now, as you mentioned, kind of that frustration of, I thought we'd be done with this. And now I feel like we're back to last year, not really making any progress. Normalizing wellness, though, is really challenging because as physicians, we're supposed to be sort of above that, you know, we're invincible. We're the ones taking care of all the sick. My father is a psychiatrist and, mm -hmm. and he is maybe one of the worst examples of self-care that I've ever seen in my life. Um, and he knows it. So he won't be surprised when he hears this, um, but cobbler has no shoes, Alexander. <laughs> exactly. 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 So, you know, what have been some of the challenges that you've seen when groups, corporations, teams try to normalize wellness and because you can very easily talk about it and then you just sort of that that's where it stops is then, you know, the, the proof is really in the pudding. You have to then be able to have actionable sort of items where people are doing that. You can talk about it all you want. So what are some of the challenges you've seen when you've tried to see that get normalized? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think this comes back to leadership by example, right? So there's leadership in action, how you take care of your team. If you want to change something, if you're ever leading a change or you're leading an initiative, you have to lead by that example. And I think a great way to do this, I'm thinking of another company that I talked to that says we're, we're trying to inspire more innovation and more creativity. And, and we had like 20 rehearsals for, you know, a one hour keynote, which, which I just don't do <laughs> or won't do again, but I mean, nobody does that. Right. And I was like, my God, like there is no tolerance for error here. None. Right. And and so you can't have creativity and innovation in that kind of an environment. So as a leader, what I think you've got to be able to do is step back and be self-reflective enough to do your own work, right? You've got to do your own work first 
and then be able to say, hey, I'm going to talk about this, uh, this thing that I was doing that I thought was going to work and it just didn't work. You know, like be willing to talk about your own failures openly. I, and I mean, really openly, like, you know, those people that humble brag, which that's not it, right? <laughs> but, but they're really something like that really didn't work. And, and maybe even make, if, you, if necessary, make an apology. Like, hey guys, you know what? We focus too much on that. And I want to apologize for that. I, we're going to take a different tact. I've been listening to you all. I've heard the feedback. And this is how we want to try to incorporate that. And then we'll come back and check with you again. So it's it's that opportunity to be more vulnerable. Uh, in the case of wellness, it might be that if you're the CEO or you're the head of the practice or whatever it is, it's like, hey, guys, I'm leaving today after this last surgery. I'm going to be off. You probably don't go offline, but certain medical field is probably not a good example of that. But whatever it is that you can do to set boundaries, I'm setting this boundary. Unless it's an emergency, I'm not going to be available. So please, uh, I'll see you on Monday morning. I don't want to have an email from you. I'm not going to send you an email uh, or a text or a page or whatever it is that you do if it's not an emergency. Just don't do that. So you've got to show that, model that, and, and then hold people accountable to that. And so for various other companies not in the medical field, that might mean saying emails are only between like eight and five, right? That's it. Or whatever your hours are, seven and six or something. Um, they're not on the weekends. You don't send them and you don't reply to them as the boss. Because if you do, you're not modeling that kind of boundary setting and that kind of self-care that you want your people to do because you're not doing it for yourself. And so I think that's the hard part is we have to hold ourselves as leaders accountable. And then we have to model that. And then we have to be willing to share vulnerably uh, what those failures are. Say, hey, guys, I was, you know, I said we were going to make this a priority. I have not personally done that. I'm sorry. I, this is how I'm going to move forward. And I want to support you in doing that too. I mean, imagine if your boss said that. I've never had a boss say that. It's pretty amazing, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's funny. I, I've thought a lot about, I'm, a, I'm guilty of, you know, late emails and super early emails and, and I'm not modeling kind of self-care in doing that. I totally agree. And I just needed to, to, to change. But as you said, easier said than done. And Chuck, I will tell you the end of last year, I literally collapsed for like 48 hours. And it was December. I, I did not get out of bed for 48 hours. My husband thought I had COVID. He wouldn't even come down to my side of the house, which I did not. I was tested. Uh, but uh, and I knew I didn't. I knew I was just exhausted. And I talked to people all the time about how you set your boundaries, how you lead. And I was like, my God, I'm not even doing this myself. And, and I teach this. Right. And I think that is something that has been uh, was an eye opener for me. And I'm Thank God the kids just took off to school today because I was like, you know what? I'm going for a bike ride. I'm going for like an hour and a half bike ride. I'm not just doing 45 minutes. And so we have to start like permitting ourselves to take care of ourselves. And then I got great work done, way better work than I've been getting when I just, you know, have been interrupted and try to push through a long day. So, so yeah, we, we do have to do it ourselves, see the benefit and then share that openly. It's so true. The uh, an expression I heard recently, which I'm probably just behind the times, uh, is surge capacity. You know, in the hospital world, we use surge capacity to talk about, can we squeeze more patients in the hospital when it's really busy? But surge capacity in the, in the, with the meaning of the pandemic and how long can we, you know, can we act um, at this stress-filled level of the pandemic? And when will our surge capacity run out? I love that expression. It really captures everything. But it's intimately related to grit, I would presume. So how do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked this question. And this this does all tie together. It's one of the questions that I get, not quite in those terms, but I, I do love that as well, the surge capacity, right? And, and the way that I think about this is that grit is not a sustainable operating mode. We probably talked about this at the presidential keynote, but it's an important thing to remember, right? It's it gets so much kind of cachet, and it is, it's so important to success. But it is a surge thing. It's not an operational mode. And so I think one of the things that's really important as a leader is to be able to say, hey, when have we, when have we stopped? <laughs> like, when have we recharged? And, and not just like, you know, after five o'clock or after 8 p.m. or whatever your, the end of your day is or after your last surgery or whatever, but, but and not just on the weekends, but there are several companies, and I really applaud them for this, for setting the example in this. And I know it's harder in the medical field, although possibly with orthopedics, you guys might be able to do it because some of these are elective, right? Is they've taken a week and they've said, you know what? We're shutting down for a week. Nobody's online. There's no emails. There's no meetings. There's no nothing. You go off. You go, go somewhere with your families. And it's not a normal week. You know, it's not a normal like holiday week. 
And they're just saying, they're recognizing that people are exhausted, that grit is not sustainable. It's critical, but it's not sustainable. And so you've got to find a way again to set the boundaries within the individual work day and the work week, but also in the overall rhythm of things. And I think knowing that people are really tired, man, I mean, we've been saying that for a year, but it's, it's just even more true now. And finding a way to, whether it's you know your whole practice or whether it's one person at a time or whatever it is, say, look, you need to take a week. We're not going to charge us against your leave. You're just going to take a week and go, go somewhere. Go, go relax. Go sit by the lake. Wear your mask, but sit by the lake. You know? <laughs> but uh, I think that's a really important thing. So it's just a reminder that, yeah, you're right. Grit's about surge. It's not about, it's not about the norm or it should not be. It cannot be sustained that way. What are maybe some of the traps that you've seen people kind of get themselves into when they're trying to schedule this? Because, you know, it, the biggest thing I hear when people talk about wellness is I'm going to work out every day. But then for me, it means I'm getting up at four in the morning to work out every day, which is probably not actually that good of self-care because then I get an email from Chuck at 530 this morning that I can reply to because I've been up for an hour and a half. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, so what are some of those kind of traps that you see people run into where they're almost, you know, they're putting that wellness and that self-care kind of on top of that surge and they're just over expanding themselves. Right. Well, I, I think it's just like anything else. It's whenever you add something or whenever your boss tries to add something to you, uh, you've got to take something else away. Right. Uh, so there's two traps. That's the first one. The first is you can't just keep adding on. I, my son, I know, has a ski strength training class that he wants to add on. And his, he's just starting school again. And so he's got all his school. Plus, he's got cross country. I'm like, look, let's not add it all at once. <laughs> right. Like, see what you can handle. And then maybe you take something away and then you add something else. Um, the other thing is thinking that, for example, your workout, like I got in a 90 minute ride today. That's awesome. It doesn't have to be 90 minutes. It can be 30 minutes, right? I mean, it can be. So judging success by the wrong metrics of whether it's, you know, hey, I have to do seven days a week. No, you don't. You can do five days a week, right? And I have to do 90 minutes every day. That's a great goal. But maybe if you're in the midst of like the craziest you know, most intense scheduling that you've had in the last year, that's not the right time to implement that. But just start with that 10 minutes or start with that 20 minutes or start with that 30 minutes. Define success by just making the effort. I'm thinking of all these metaphors that are uh, that are kid related, but we'll try to keep it to the <laughs> to the surgery and, and corporate level. So yeah, so don't define success by the wrong metrics. Give yourself a little bit of, of wiggle room and don't continue to add on. See what you can take away. And there has to be something, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you can't keep going with that. And uh, a good friend who is uh, works at a venture capital firm in Boston just uh, found out that she had a recurrence of some cancer and she had to be out for a couple of months. And, uh, and by her being out, they had to bring in two people to do her job. And so now she's going back and they were like, oh, I guess we sort of had you kind of had too much to do. And she's like, really, you think? I, so I think, I, I, so So start doing that work now because you can't afford to lose people or yourself because you're, you're overscheduled, you're exhausted and you get sick, right? I mean, you, you, can't, you can't do that. So, so taking those preventative measures now, I think is really just about operating maturely. And I think all of us have been pushing so hard and it's time to just say, hey, what's realistic here? What's realistic? And if, if it's not realistic to get in, I'm making something up, 100 surgeries in a week, then what is realistic? Or what do we need to do to change to be able to manage this other capacity? How do we need to restructure the organization? How do we need to talk to the hospital? Again, I'm sorry, I'm talking a little bit out of my league here. But, but what are the changes we need to make to make this possible? Because this is not sustainable. And, uh, and I think we're at a really important inflection point where we need to have those conversations because we cannot sustain the way we've been going. And, and it's an opportunity. So in terms of that reframing, that technique, that positive psychology technique, right? This is an opportunity to reframe things where you have people who then suddenly maybe you have more people that want to come into your field because you figured out how to make it manageable. It's not totally insane all the time. Um, so I think those conversations are important ones to have. It's more strategic, right? You're getting out of the tactical level of day to day and any leader knows you have to make time for the strategic. And that is a big error in a lot of leadership is getting stuck in the tactical day to day because there's so much to do and there is so much to do, but you have to make time for that strategic planning as well. And that strategic planning right now should be, how do we make this sustainable for all of our doctors, all of our caregivers? How, how do we make this work for the long term? So this has been fantastic. Uh, I'm grateful 
for Dr. Parsons inviting you to be the keynote speaker at the annual meeting. And I'm so grateful that you took the time for this follow-up podcast because you have, you know, really built on your initial presentation. So thank you so okay. much for being here. And all you said tonight will really resonate with the listeners. I have no doubt. Absolutely. I'm so glad, so grateful for the chance to, to talk to both of you. Thank you. Sure. So again, for all the listeners who haven't read Shannon Huffman Polson's book, The Grit Factor, you should read it. It's fantastic. And you will learn and build really skills that can help you succeed every day. And uh, I know that they are helping me and I look forward to implementing more of what we talked about tonight. Excellent. Thanks so much, Chuck. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks, Shannon. Appreciate it.